I'm David Gregory. This is Press Pass, your all-access pass to an extra Meet the Press conversation. And this week, a critical test for the Republican Party as it does some post-election soul-searching. All the while, there's a high-stakes fiscal cliff set of talks going on here in Washington. Joining me now, Rick Santorum. One of the GOP's most outspoken conservative leaders as a former senator and, of course, presidential candidate. And naturally, he's raising some 2016 speculation. Senator Santorum, good to have you back here. Well, thank you, David. So thank let's you. get right to that. How do you look at 2016 right now? There's obviously expectation that you'll be in that hunt. So where's your head now? Uh, my head now is we've got a lot on our plate. Uh, there's so much. There's so much, as I said during the campaign, uh, this is the most critical election, I thought, in our, in our mm -hmm. country's history, and we're seeing the consequence of that now here in Washington, around the world, and uh, we're trying to stay engaged in that. I, I started an organization called Patriot Voices, and so we've, uh, we've sort of jumped in with that. Uh, just last week, we got involved in a treaty on, on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the U.S. Senate was trying to pass a U.N. Uh, treaty that uh, we felt uh, was an overreach, something that would involve the United Nations in, uh, in the rights of parents and being able to, uh, to provide what's best for their disabled children and as well as some other things that, uh, uh, that uh, were disconcerting about the UN and their reach here. And uh, we were able to rally a lot of folks. I think most people would say that but for our action there and what we did, the Senate probably would have passed that. So uh, we're going to stay active and engaged up there in Capitol Hill because as you're, we're going to talk about soon, there's a lot of folks that want to Republicans want to move in another direction. Yeah. Uh, they want to sort of walk away from the founding principles and what Republicans have stood for. And uh, we're going to be there to hold their feet to the fire and, and present a very different, uh, di very different vision. Would you like to go through it again? Do you think you can win if you did it again? Uh, you know, what I've said is I'm just, it's four years from now. I'm going to keep my options open and we're going to stay involved in the fray and we'll wait and see how things turn out. I mean, I felt like um, we were well positioned in 2012 to be the candidate that Barack Obama really didn't want to run against. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'll wait and see how, how 2016 What do you out. take away from this race? What's the big lesson from this campaign? Well, a, a couple of things. Uh, you know, this idea that, well, we have to walk away from certain issues because, you know, they're not winning issues anymore, the moral cultural issues. Uh, my response to that is when we play defense, we lose. And Mitt Romney, John McCain, if you go before that, were, refused to pay, play offense. The president played offense. People were stunned. Republicans were stunned that he was going out there and playing offense on abortion, playing offense on Planned Parenthood. I mean, running ads mm -hmm. saying, you know, uh, and, and what we did was simply respond, say, oh, no, we're not that bad. The president of the United States, as a, United, as a state senator in, in, in Illinois, voted for infanticide. I mean, this, he voted against partial. This, this is a man who has the most radical record on these issues uh, of any president in history, and yet we didn't bring them up at all. So my feeling is, it, unless you feel comfortable in your skin on any issue, then you're going to have a hard time playing offense on that and issue. So the, and, and so we had candidates that didn't feel comfortable on these issues, and as a result, we played defense, and then therefore we lost on this. So this issues. is the idea that and this, all throughout the campaign was this warning, that if Romney loses, there'll be a lot of people, including yourself, who would say, you just weren't conservative enough. And it's basically not that he wasn't caved conservative. on that. It wasn't he was, Mitt Romney held the same positions that I did, but he didn't weave them into the debate and the discussion. He didn't weave them into what, here's, here's our vision for America. Here's, here's you know, let me, let me talk to all voters. Un unfortunately, I always say, you know, Mitt Romney focused as well he should have on the economy, but he talked a lot about jobs and jobs yeah. and jobs. 92% of Americans roughly, you know, if you, of, of Americans looking for work, according to the uh, unemployment numbers, have a job. So who are you talking to? I mean, we, people... Oh, that other 92 percent, while they are concerned about their job and maybe improving their job, are concerned about a whole lot of other issues, national security issues, which is, again, we're, we're sort of pushed to the side. And that's another area that I've been very, very active on. So I, I just think we need a candidate who is comfortable in their skin with the positions that Mitt Romney said he held. It's not that Mitt Romney wasn't conservative enough in the positions he articulated. He just didn't run a campaign on all those issues and bring them to the fore in a way that was convincing that he actually was going to do something. So if price. you think about the, the as you think about the future of the Republican Party right now, as I talk to conservatives, one of the things they say is we're not sufficiently a party of working people. Yeah. Uh, and then there's all the constituency groups that the president did so well with, particularly Latinos. So the, the, I would tea, agree the Tea with, Party strange. I would, agree, I would agree with you on yeah. the working people. Look, uh, the, the Romney campaign after the election, uh, 
said, uh, we, we had a meeting a couple days later, and they said, we wanted to share, share a poll with you. Because we, we kept finding in the last um, several primaries that all these early exit polls were wrong on you, that you, you were trailing badly, and then you'd win these states and, we, and, and come out of nowhere. And so we started asking a question we usually don't ask, which is not only who you're going to vote for, but when are you planning to vote? And they showed me a poll from Pennsylvania that if they voted before noon, Romney won by four. If you voted between noon and, excuse me, I won by four. If you voted between noon and five, Romney won by five. But if you voted, this was from Pennsylvania before I got out. If you voted after five o'clock, I won by 21 points. And it was the guys coming home from work, or, the, or guys, guys and gals coming home yep. from work. And so we, we saw this in Ohio where, you know, in the, in the counties that we won, Romney's votes were really, really depressed. And those were blue-collar counties. Those were working folks. These were lower and, and lower middle-income folks that we were able to connect with. Why? Because we talked about manufacturing. We talked about improving skills. We talked about not having programs up here on Capitol Hill that just focused on going to college, but focused on trade schools. Talked about getting skills, improving skills. That was a big part of what we talked about in this campaign that people tend to ignore. But it was very much a message focused in on Latinos, focused in on because Latinos make a, a, a large segment of Latino, Latinos, probably disproportionately, are lower middle income and lower income. And you can you can have a conversation. We said, look, we have a plan to help strengthen your opportunities to move forward, to rise in society. And we understand that the family is a very important part of that, your family and community. And so we talked about the importance of strong families and, and those bonds to be able to prepare people for those jobs in the future. So what is the future of the Republican Party in a shorter description? Uh, the future of the Republican Party is a party that uh, understands that limited government, just saying limited government and free markets is not enough. That we have to have a message to say, how does that work for you? And, and that's why we, we, we put together specific policies that, that did, in fact, and free market policies that did, in fact, address lower and middle income Americans. And, and if we don't do that, if we don't go out and say, here's how, you know, for example, uh, Barack Obama sort of stepped on it when he said, you know, you didn't build that. And so Mitt Romney went out and legitimately criticized him for that. But he went out there with a bunch of small business people and not so small business people. We could have gone out there with the people who work for the small business person, the person whose job is relying, who knows the owner of that business, who says, you know, look, we built this together, and here's how this helps, here's, here's how what these policies help me. And I don't think we did that. I know we didn't do that. We didn't even try to do that. That's what we tried to do in, in, in our race. I think it's one of the reasons we did as well as we did. And uh, I'm certainly going to be out there uh, and have been out there already. Uh, I wrote an op-ed right after the, uh, the election for USA Today that, that I talked about. It's not so much about Latinos. It's not so much about you know, uh, not doing well among minorities. It's not doing well among that group of voters who don't think that we care about working men and women trying to rise in society and not just care about the, the great achievers. I mean, one of the other things is Republicans tend to come across as, well, we want folks to take risk and we want them to, you know, be out there on their own. A lot of folks in America, you know, want to volunteer after, their, after they punch the clock at five o'clock. They want to be, be home with their family. They want to be out with their friends. They want a, a good job. They want to have the opportunity to rise, but they're very happy having stability and security in their life and not reaching for the brass ring that Republicans tend to just seem to focus too much on. So I think we have to understand there are different elements of America who share our values, mm -hmm. but we aren't talking to them. Taxes. You're hearing it this week. There seem to be a lot more conservatives on Capitol Hill saying, go ahead, give on tax rates so that we can get a better deal that can address Medicare they can address some of the things we care about in the debt. You don't buy that. You don't think it's the right approach. I don't think this president's willing to deal. I, I, I haven't seen anything in this president's four years or, or since, uh, since the election that he's really interested in fundamentally. This, this president is addicted to spending. He's a spending addict. Uh, problem is we have a lot of spending acts on Capitol Hill, Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need, we need a real radical intervention here. If you've got an addiction, you've got to do something radical to, to pull that person back. Does he and have the leverage, though? He won the election. He does. does he have the leverage he, on this? The greatest leverage he, he has... He can get the tax rate increase, yeah, you think? The greatest, the greatest leverage he has is that he put together a deal with Republicans over a year ago that gives him pretty much what he wants, which is a dramatic increase, which is taxes back to the, to the pre-Bush rates. Right. 
So he gets all his tax increases, and he can blame the ones that are not popular on Republicans for not negotiating. He gets something he'll never get. He'll never get in a negotiation. If you look at the spending cuts, half out of defense, half out of domestic, defense makes up 16% of the budget. Mm -hmm. The rest is domestic. There's no way that you're going to have any kind of budget deal that's negotiated that's going to take as much out of defense as it is out of discretion. So you think he's got leverage because he can say, hey, fine, go over the cliff, we'll be okay. He wants those defense cuts. Mm -hmm. He's proposed them in the past. So he gets all his defense cuts, more than he would ever get in a negotiation. He gets all his tax increases, including the money from the unpopular ones, which he wants anyway. He just doesn't say he wants it, but he wants the money. Because he, because he wants more spending. He wants to be able to spend more. And he gets really a fairly small down payment on domestic discretionary cuts and entitlement cuts. Half a trillion dollars is, as you know, a drop in the bucket of what we're going to have to do. So he really doesn't cut that much on the things he cares about. And he gets two things that he wants. One of the things he's going to be facing in his second term is a Middle East that's in even more turmoil than in his first term. What would you do about Syria right now? Well, the big problem here is is radical Islam and the president's refusal to really address that issue. I mean, the president he went here's the president went out and ran on women's issues. And we have Egypt imposing Sharia law. And you don't hear a word out of this president. Sharia law means women have to have head coverings, have no rights. And you don't hear the president say a word about Sharia. You haven't heard him condemn Sharia or radical Islam. You haven't you haven't heard him talk about you know, the problems that are now coming up with Muslim Brotherhood now in control of Egypt, in Libya, and we see obviously elements of the Muslim Brotherhood as part of uh, the Syrian alliance. You now see it going on in Jordan. This neighborhood for Israel is getting very, very uncomfortable. Used to be surrounding Israel were, in some cases, with the exception of Jordan, either cool pieces or hostile, in the case of Syria and Lebanon. But they were controlled by basically non religious dictators. Now we have dictators, as you've seen Morrissey doing in, in Egypt, you know, dictating a new constitution, but now you have Sharia law, radical Islamists, and who have a theological reason to go after the state of Israel as well as the rest Western world. This is a much more dangerous world, and, and Barack Obama is responsible for it because he engendered this movement by throwing uh, uh, Mubarak under the bus, uh, doing the same for other leaders in, in the region, instead of lining up and perhaps uh, there was certainly perhaps he, you're overstating how much influence he had over being able to keep the previous pharaoh in power well, in, I, uh, in I, Egypt. I, but what specifically would you do about Syria at this point that looks to be a regime on the brink of something and not a lot of great options? Yeah, well, that's the problem. We, you know, it's it's. You're, you, you asked me the question when, when, because of the policies of this administration, we have two horrible options. So which horrible option do you want to take? Do you want a dictator who is allied, allied with Iran, who is being supported by Iran, which is a great threat to, to the region? Or do you want a group of radical Islamists who are going to take over uh, when, uh, if, if they topple uh, Assad? Uh, I'm not too sure there is a good answer right now. I'm not too sure we did a very good job. Uh, if, if we were going to engage ourselves in Syria, d- did a very good job in, in working with others in the region who might be friendly to, uh, to a less radical uh, rebellion, if you will, against Assad and structuring that rebellion and influencing that. But we didn't. And now I think we're, we're caught with, with no good choices. Rick Santorum, we'll be following your, uh, your activity here in the run-up to 2016. I'll be around. All right. Thank you. Thank you.